David Hubel was born in Windsor in 1926. He grew up in Montreal, where his early interest in chemistry and electronics led him to study mathematics and physics at McGill. When I finished, it was perfectly clear that I wasn't uh, enough of a virtuoso at mathematics to do that as a career. And I'm not sure I would have, that it would have been right for me anyhow as a career. And I hadn't had enough, a good enough preparation, I think, to go on in, in physics. Uh, so I had applied to graduate school and had been accepted at McGill in physics. But on a sort of last minute whim, I thought it might be fun to try medicine. Uh, never having had a course in biology, even in high school. Um, and <clears throat> so I applied, and, and to my horror, I was accepted. <laughs> and, uh, and then I didn't know what to do. He became my best friend uh, in medical school, and then we both interned, uh, did our junior internship. Now they call it the residency, first year residency, at the Montreal General. And uh, we were roommates then. And we were on call every second night, which meant that you got up, uh, almost every night uh, at, the, at the hospital. He, uh, before going to bed, he was always reading something. And I thought he was reading a novel or something to relax before going to bed. And one day I, I went in and said, what are you reading? And I looked up. It was a, a book on advanced algebra, which uh, he was doing. He had a pencil and was doing mathematics to relax himself. During his residency at Montreal General, he spent his summers doing electronics at the Neuro. This exposure led him to apply for a year of neurological study at Johns Hopkins in 1954. But as a dual citizen, he was drafted upon entry to the United States and didn't actually arrive at Hopkins until four years later. Steve and Torsten Weasel and I had a conference at the, at the canteen at, uh, <clears throat> over lunch at Hopkins to decide what we were going to do. And it was pretty obvious, I think, to us all what we should do. And that was to sort of extend Kufler's work, which had been in the retina, uh, up to the cerebral cortex, and try to record from cortical cells and see how they worked. When we were roommates, he had an apparatus on the floor. Uh, this was 1951, so we didn't have uh, PCs. We didn't uh, have computers at that time. But it looked like a computer today, but it had a screen, a round screen and occasionally he would play with it and you'd see beeps. And I said, what's this? And he says, it's a cathode ray oscillograph. Now, I did not know what that was. I still don't know. But uh, he had built that one himself. He had put that one together. And that was his, his background in physics and mathematics that allowed him to do that. And looking at what he's done, his major contribution was to be able to develop uh, probes, electrical probes, that will pick up impulses in one cell. Having no uh, expectations, not even knowing whether the whole thing would work, we started in recording and um, recorded single cells in the cortex and asked what should we do uh, with the patterns that we showed the animal, which in this case was the cat. Uh, how should we arrange those patterns? to try and get the cells in the cortex to respond. And in the beginning, nothing we did seemed to work for the first few experiments. But then suddenly we hit on, on something that, that made the cells fire like crazy. And that, that turned out to be using uh, straight line stimuli and projecting those onto the retina. And it turned out that what the cortical cells seem to be interested in and is uh, this is still what we think to this day, that the cells record best to contours of lines. It was the first uh, idea of how the visual cortex sees a pattern, as it were, and that was very important. I remember his lecture when he uh, came to the neuro uh, to describe this work. Uh, he would show uh, a horizontal or, or an oblique line going across the screen, and he had a sound recorder, and when the which represented the nerve cells output and when the when the bar of light went across a certain direction you got nothing when it changed to a certain angle and went across again you could hear the putt 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 of the nerve cell it was very dramatic for this work david hubel and torsten wiesel 
shared the 1981 Nobel Prize in Medicine. But David Hubel has never been one to rest on his laurels. One of the characteristics of David is that uh, often when you get the Nobel Prize, uh, you start giving lectures throughout the world, and uh, he had lots of honors and awards after that, but he kept working. Uh, if you look at his curriculum vitae, the number of, uh, of publications that he's had after the Nobel Prize are as numerous as before the Nobel Prize. It would seem a, a thankless thing to do, not to appreciate the chances that, that one has, the, the colleagues that one has, the students themselves whom I advise and, and mentor, and just research is is largely playing, uh, and and that if it isn't fun, one wouldn't do it. <laughs> so it isn't that every minute is fun, but by and large, it's just deeply rewarding and with uh, exciting things happening almost every day.